All right, here we are at the beginning of week seven. And uh, next week is spring break, so uh, we get to take a bit of a breather. So what I'm going to do right now is just go through uh, the agenda for this week, tell you about some things, and then uh, try and uh, explain some of the readings that we've already had and give you a preview of uh, some of the things you're going to be looking at in the module for week seven, and then end up by talking about the midterm uh, visual analysis uh, essay. All right. So there are two pieces of visual communication in the news this week. One of them is in that module called Visual Communication in the News, and it's rather disturbing. It was actually on the front page of today's New York Times, and it talked about the fact that now anybody can download an app and pretty easily make rather convincing fake videos. And the example that they talked about uh, in the New York Times article is that somebody had taken Michelle Obama's face and superimposed it onto uh, a, a porno video. So um, the consequences of this um, for the general public are that um, we now kind of know that you can't trust a photograph to be representation of the truth, as, as many of you will uh, now know from your experiences of making your uh, visual uh, self-portraits. Self uh, but now the same is going to be true for video. Once upon a time, uh, it required extremely expensive uh, hardware and software and uh, great skill to do the kind of things that were in that movie Forrest Gump, where uh, Tom Hanks is inserted into archival footage of um, the, the Nixon White House or um, um, you know various events. Well, now there's an app that you can download and just about anybody is going to be able to make fairly convincing fake videos. So that's a little problematic. The other piece of visual communication in the news, I've actually loaded in as the last page in the module for week seven, and it is from this week's New York Times Magazine, and it's called The Business of Color, and it's about a company uh, by the name of Pantone, and Pantone has sort of cornered the market on um, okay, if you have a certain blue, cerulean blue, um, they will give it a name and a number, and that way people who make uh, paint for your home, or people who make fabric for your curtains, or people who make upholstery for your car, uh, can all be in agreement on what a certain color is. It'll have a name, it'll have a number, and Pantone are the people sort of in charge of designating those things. And so in that uh, page on the module, uh, and, and in the article itself, there was a pointer to a scene. If some of you saw The Devil Wears Prada, uh, there's a scene in which Meryl Streep's character uh, basically takes uh, Anne Hathaway's character to task for having laughed at the fact that she couldn't tell the difference between two color blues. And Meryl Streep uh, ends up kind of um, giving her quite a, a dressing down and saying that, um, you know, she thinks she... she chose the blue sweater that she happens to be wearing, but in fact, uh, it was chosen by people in the room who make those kind of decisions. So uh, it's a fairly interesting article about the business of color. All right, uh, quick comments on the visual design projects number two. I thought you all did just wonderfully. Uh, I enjoyed looking at them. I'm kind of surprised at how many of us share the same aspirations to uh, be uh, Olympic or other uh, athletic uh, medal winners. Uh, and then uh, uh, Tori wanted to do a TED Talk. I would like to do that. Uh, and Andrew would like to have a house nice enough for it to be on MTV Cribs. And I share that, uh, share that desire. So what I did was I put all of your um, images into one page. It's in the module called Visual Design Project Number 2. In the announcement that I sent out earlier, there's a link to it. So um, as we have more and more stuff in this Canvas site, some stuff gets a little difficult to find but that visual design module uh, is down underneath some of the other things that, you know, after all of our uh, weekly modules plus the visual communication and the news module. So discuss the Oswald and Levy readings. So the Oswald reading, I thought, was um, a pretty good job of sort of applying some of these more um, esoteric, 
uh, theories. When you're reading them as written by the French philosopher and semiotician Roland Barthes, um, it gets pretty wiggy pretty quickly. But uh, Oswald, um, after the introduction, and some of that was stuff, I said you didn't have to read certain pages because we already covered that almost in the first week, week when we were talking about Saussurian linguists, linguistics versus Piercean linguistics. But one of the things that keeps coming up is this notion of um, structuralism. And so um, Oswald has a couple of charts, and here I have them in the hard copy, but when I'm done recording this, I will actually bring in linkages to these uh, sort of structuralist um, diagrams. You could call them semiotic squares. And um, they rely on the idea that there are all these opposites. So we have male and we have female. We have power, we have powerless. We have mature versus trendy. We have individualistic versus social. So these different concepts that are in these diagrams are ones that can help people talk about an image and what it is communicating. So again, we're back to that idea that we communicate with words. Images have this tremendous power to communicate, but our ability to talk about images depends upon some agreement, uh, you know, linguistic terms, theoretical terms. So um, Oswald does, I think, a pretty good job of applying this uh, semiotics to a couple case studies. So she's got the case study of McDonald's and how they were hurting at one point because they were losing market share and part of it had to do with the fact that they seemed to not take seriously uh, a very large uh, segment of the market, which were the women. And so they, they did some uh, semiotic analysis and came up with some advertising that was sort of more appealing and friendly to women. And then we had um, um, a compact computer that ended up failing. And so the final question on the quiz uh, was what, how might they have positioned themselves to uh, do better with respect to you know, their relationship to Apple and IBM. And uh, several of you gave nice long explanations that were accurate, but it really came down to what Compaq needed to do was position itself as the Chevy of personal computers. And that would have been somewhere between the uh, button-down business of the IBM PC and the uh, RD sort of uh, you know, free, uh, uh, free-flowing uh, approach of Apple. So I thought that uh, the Oswald essay, uh, if nothing else, she did a good job of applying semiotics to a couple of cases and particularly used some of the tools to talk about uh, images that were in there. And then the Levy reading, um, I thought that was really charming, particularly because if you look at it, that doesn't look like the Harvard Business Review of today uh, because it's from the 50s, but the, the clip art in it made it uh, uh, quite almost silly. And so, uh, but he had some really good points. Levy, or Oswald says that Levy basically is the one who introduced the idea that advertising uh, and consumer branding uh, is working in symbols. And so before this, uh, people hadn't thought much about it. So even though Levy doesn't use any of the new technical jargon of semiotics, he really was saying that what we have are symbols for sale. And if you think of, you say, well, you know, how symbolic is all this stuff? Imagine you have a teenager who would like a pair of Air Jordans and they would like an iPhone. And instead, what you deliver to them are sort of the, you know, uh, brand, you know, Sears brand name sneakers and some, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, old Nokia phone. They would be, you know, just heartbroken at how you had sort of uh, uh, not met their expectations because. It's not the actual sneaker or the phone itself so much as what Air Jordan symbolize and what an iPhone symbolizes. And so these and other brands have succeeded very well in selling people these ideas that are really about their identity. Okay? So what you're going to find in the module for week seven is uh, a lot of stuff on logo and brand design. And so most of this is stuff that you'll be reading or viewing inside of Canvas. Uh, initially, there's some theory about how logos work. Um, there's some pretty nice examples of logos for the National Hockey League. And if you look at those and see the ones that are considered the best and the worst, 
you'll probably get a sense of, you know, why is it that these uh, old style ones are really regarded as the best and why is it some of the new ones are, are really the worst. But in addition, you will find um, an article that talks about, you know, what makes a good logo, what should it do. Um, we have also a short video about Google. When Google redid its logo, uh, a lot of people were sort of appalled by that because uh, they like the old logo. And so people uh, do not respond well to change. But there's some uh, interesting commentary on, um, you know, there's, there's both a video by Google about the new logo, and then there's a uh, article about people's uh, resistance to the new logo. Um, and then there's also a page on the evolution of the Starbucks logo. The Starbucks logo has changed four or five times already um, since the firm was founded. It's not that old. And so there are reasons behind the logo. And one of the things that the Starbucks logo that other logos are doing is becoming more pictorial and they have fewer words. And so this is a trend which seems to be, uh, you know, all logos seem to be going in that direction. There's then a page about Chip Kidd, who is the premier um, book designer. Um, if you were to go into a Barnes and Nobles and, and look at some of the biggest best-selling books that had, you know, really uh, sort of strongly attractive graphical covers, there's a good chance that Chip Kidd is the designer who designed some of those. So I have a link to the Chip Kidd site. I'd say look around in there because uh, he's he's just a brilliant designer and there's uh, and he's very entertaining. So there's a lot of good stuff in there. But there's also a page for Milton Glaser, who is sort of one of the premier graphic designers uh, of our time. Um, if you've ever seen the I Love New York uh, um, logo, that is his work. Um, there's a famous um, uh, sort of multicolor image of Bob Dylan that was uh, an insert into a, a Dylan uh, album from the 60s, etc. So Milton Glaser is, is just brilliant. And there's also a page from Naomi Klein. Naomi Klein is a Canadian. She's a sort of a theorist. She's an educator. And so she has a book called No Logo. And so the gist of that is logos are not innocent and logos are not necessarily your friends. And so it's quite a critique of the degree to which we are constantly bombarded with these logos. And so, you know, we as mature adults, we can say, oh, fine, we can ignore it. We can do whatever we want. When you think of the impact on young people and the way they are then sort of uh, exhorted to uh, own this and buy that and have the best one and the most expensive one. Uh, so Naomi Klein has uh, some fairly strong opinions on the harmful and negative aspects of uh, the way logos have pervaded our society. Um, and then we've got the Olympic pictograms through the ages. And that one is, um, uh, Heller is his name, and he is uh, sort of one of the premier graphic designers of, of all time. And so that's a, a short little video, which is, is quite entertaining and uh, will communicate quite a bit in a short period. Okay. So let me see if this. Oh, also, um, Levy mentions the Spring Made ad, the Clabber Girl and the Pepsi Girl. And so one of the things he says is suggests that the average consumer might miss or ignore the humor in a Spring Made sheet advertisement. And so this is a copy of such an ad. Um, it, you know, you could say, well, it's humorous. You could also say it's sexist, it's racist. So uh, it may not be deemed as humorous today as it was in the 50s. But at the time, um, there was sort of a message there. And so then there's the example of the uh, sort of clabber girl as an example of uh, an outdated symbol. And then we have the more current Pepsi girl, but this is the Pepsi girl from the 50s. So um, those are kind of interesting. Um, there's a whole thing on logo and brand design that includes um, Hillary Clinton's logo in a 2016 campaign, the original Trump-Pence logo, which was then revised because people made a uh, sort of uh, scandalous uh, animated GIF of it, and so they switched to a different logo. Then we've got the uh, NHL logos. Um, Google's new logo. Starbucks, so there are four different Starbucks. So from 1971, when it said Starbucks coffee, tea, and spices, to the present one, which I'm not sure when the present one was launched, uh, but the, that one now has no words. So it went for with more words, 
to fewer words, to no words, and theirs is not the only logo that has gone in that direction. We've got Chip Kid, we've got Milton Glaser, we've got uh, No Logo, Pictograms. All right, and then now we get to the assignment, so the midterm essay assignment. There is a page for Paul Martin Lester's Six Perspective. If you think back to the first class meeting, and we talked about different approaches, there was Gestalt, etc. And one was the Lester Huxley model. And it's called that because Paul Martin Lester, a current uh, faculty member in California who teaches uh, visual communication, um, is a great believer in some of the things that Huxley said about images, including the more you know, the more you see. So Paul Martin Lex, uh, Paul Martin Lester's book is called Visual Communication Images with Messages. And so what I have done is I've uploaded one chapter of this book, and it is um, section four, the media through which we see. And what it does is it introduces Paul Martin Lester's six perspectives, and they are personal, historical, technical, ethical, cultural, and critical. And so you should read that article, read that chapter. It's not long. It's pretty straightforward because when you look at the midterm image analysis assignment, you will see that you have the option of picking any number of the theoretical approaches that we've covered so far. Most people, for the past three times that I've taught this course, have chosen Paul Martin Lester's six perspectives because it is very easy to apply. And so uh, I'd say, by all means, choose that if you want. If you'd rather choose Gestalt approach, you can do that. If you remember that uh, 35 slide PowerPoint, how pictures work, that is basically a pictorial representation of the Gestalt approach. So you could do a Gestalt analysis. You could try to do something with uh, Roland Barthes semiotic analysis of an image. Um, the assignment specifies that the image you pick, and you can pick anything, you can pick an ad, and as Bart said, one of the advantages of picking an ad, there's no ambiguity as to what the advertiser was trying to do. They're at least trying to get you to uh, know what they sold and think positively of their product in some way. Um, so you could pick an ad, but you could pick a, a, a work of fine art, you could pick a painting, you could pick a work of your own art. Uh, you can pick some graffiti that's on a wall somewhere. So there's no restrictions. Or that whole collection of images, when we had the first shot in analyzing an image, you looked at a whole collection of what are news photographs from the New York Times, and it was the year in pictures. So you pick any image that you want, and then analyze it using some theory that you would like to apply to it. But if the image has any words, then you need to also address the words. And this is specified in the details on the images uh, on the assignment. Um, so there you can choose to either use Bart's uh, approach to uh, the way words often serve as anchorage for an image, or you could use either of the Lupton and Miller essays that are talking about uh, typography and words, or you could use uh, uh, the uh, uh, Goodhart Wilcox chapter, which talks about text, etc. But um, if there are words in the image you're analyzing, you need to somehow address them. And then there's a note in the Paul Martin Lester Six perspective, Perspectives. What he does is one of his perspectives is ethical. Well, when he goes into the ethical perspective, then he branches into six different sort of ethical approaches. You don't need to try and get each one of the six ethical approaches to talk to your image because uh, in some cases it would just not be appropriate. So you might choose to just have one ethical approach if you're using the Lester Six Percent Perspectives. Um, and then what I have on the page after that, I think, is a sample that I did myself. So I took an image, it was an image that was actually on a music CD, but I knew that before it was on that music CD, it came from the 60s and it came from uh, the circumstances when the United States was involved in the Vietnam War. And so you can read my uh, uh, image essay analysis, and what I'm doing there is I am using Paul Martin Lester's six perspectives. So 
Um, I think that wraps it up for what I'm going to be saying here about this upcoming week. I will communicate to you a couple more times before we sort of reconvene in two weeks. One of those communications is going to be, I'm going to ask you to give me some feedback on how the course is going so far, uh, every aspect of it in terms of you know the videos that I am putting up here, what I'm asking you to read, the assignments that I'm asking you to do, and so that way um, I just get uh, you know take your pulse a little bit and see how it's working for you because uh, we're at the midpoint. I can certainly change some things to better suit your needs and interests. So I'm going to uh, stop this video now. Uh, I will throw in a couple of images uh, at those points where I'm talking about Oswald's use of uh, structuralism and these uh, sort of uh, these semiotic squares into the video. Um, and then I will upload it to YouTube. I will post it in our Canvas site. And um, then I will communicate a couple more things to you in the coming days. And uh, I hope that... Uh, if you are taking other courses that uh, you have an opportunity to actually take a break for spring break, there will be no classes next week, uh, and uh, we'll uh, take it up again when next we meet. Talk to you later.